Easter is almost here. We have just a few weeks left until Easter, Sunday, March 31st. And uh, man, I just want to encourage you, if you haven't already, it's time to prepare your hearts. It is time to prepare your mind. It's time to prepare your spirit for Easter. And my hope and my prayer every Easter, it feels like, is that this season will take on a new significance for you. That it won't just be another Easter season because, friends, hear me. Easter is not just a time for bunnies and egg hunts. Easter is not just a time to figure out how families are going to get together like, and have a good meal. And I'm not here to say those things aren't important, but they're not the most important. Easter is not just a time to jump on to Temu, Timu, whatever it is you want to call it today, and purchase yourself a new shirt or a new outfit, because I got to look good for Easter. Look, Easter, this is when we honor the Lord. This is when we remember the sacrifice Jesus made on the cross. That's the most important thing. Easter is a time of celebration. That, friends, our Savior isn't lying dead in a tomb somewhere. He's the only God that isn't lying dead somewhere. He's not dead. He's alive. If you didn't catch that in the worship, just keep... Like, listen, on the third day, the sun rose, the stone was rolled away. Listen, Jesus is alive. So prepare your hearts. Prepare your mind. Prepare your spirit for Easter. And together as a church for the next few weeks, we're going to do that very thing with a new series called From the Cross. So I'm going to encourage you to grab your Bibles. Open up the Bible app on your phone, on your device. We're going to be in the book of Luke this morning. Luke chapter 23. We'll be starting in verse number 32. I would invite you to stand with me as you're turning to the book of Luke in honor of God's word. Luke 23, starting in verse 32. Two others who were criminals were led away to be put to death with him, him being Jesus and when they came to the place that is called the skull, there they crucified him and the criminals, one on his right, one on his left. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they, being those who thrust Jesus onto the cross, those who were mo mocking him and ridiculing him, they were casting lots to divide his garments. And the people stood by watching, but the rulers scoffed at him, saying, He saved others, let him save himself. If he is the Christ of God, his chosen one. The soldiers also mocked him, coming up and offering him sour wine and saying, If you're the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was also an inscription above him, over him, that said, This is the king of the Jews. Now one of the criminals who were hanged railed at him, saying, Aren't you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God, since you're under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we are receiving the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. And the thief said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus says to him, truly, I say to you today, you will be with me in paradise. It was now about the sixth hour. There was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. While the sun's light failed and the curtain of the temple was torn in two, then Jesus, calling out with a loud voice, said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And having said that, he breathed his last breath. This morning, Lord, we want your words. Lord, we want a new gratitude. Lord, we want to keep our eyes fixated in your direction. That God, the most important thing in my life, the only eternal thing in my life is you. That, Father, we are going to keep our attention and our focus in your direction. That, God, you have all of us. You have complete control. That in this moment, for these next several moments, God, we're going to keep our eyes fixated towards you. Speak to us today by the power of your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Famous last words. Now, famous last words refer to to statements that are made by people, things that are said by people who are 
at the end of their life, like right before they are uh, to pass away. And these phrases are often remembered and then even sometimes become iconic due to their profound, ironic, and unfortunately sometimes their heartbreak in nature. Now, famous last words tend to be reflective. Famous last words tend and can be humorous, depending on who the person is that, that is communicating. And famous last words can sometimes be very introspective. We get a picture as to what's going on on the inside, right? We, famous last words give us a window into the mind of the person who is facing their inevitable mortality, the end of their life. We, it captures moments of vulnerability. Famous last words capture moments of wisdom and even sometimes moments of ignorance. Maybe you can recognize or experience that before. Famous last words can even capture wit and humor as people face their mortality. P.T. Barnum, the founder of the Barnum and Bailey Circus, he passed away in 1891. For those of you who don't know, that's a few years before us. I'm just let, just let you know, just in case. His famous last words were this. How were the receipts today at Madison Square Garden? How were the receipts today at Madison Square Garden? And this statement, we get a window, we get a picture into the mind of P.T. Barnum. We see that what he cares about most is money and recognition. His harshest critics, the people who criticized him the most, would tell you he had one purpose in life, one priority. And his only concern was to, how can I stuff my pockets? How can I stuff the coffers? How can I fill my bank account with as much money as absolutely possible? And his famous last words just may prove that to be an accurate assessment of his character and his purpose. Winston Churchill, Prime Minister of Great Britain during World War II, one of the most famous, one of the most quoted leaders in the history of the world. His famous last words when he died in, 18, in 1965 were this, I'm bored with it all. Bored with it all. Now, this is a man who led Great Britain through World War II. And you may not know, but he actually served a second term as, as Prime Minister of Great Britain. I'm sure lying on his deathbed was probably pretty boring to some of the things he had experienced. I'm no politician, but I'm sure he was involved in some conversations and decisions that were rather exciting. Probably kept you on your toes. I'm sure lying on his deathbed was nowhere near as thrilling as the things he had experienced, the conversations that he had been privy to. Winston Churchill had a massive stroke, went into a coma, died 12 days later after making this statement. Queen Elizabeth I died in 1603. Her famous last words, all of my possessions for one moment in time. She realized and understood the value of life. She realized that life is precious and moments matter. And for some, let's be honest, for for far too many, we don't realize how important time is. We don't realize how valuable moments are until we don't have any more. We don't realize the significance of life. We don't realize the value of relationships until they're gone. Leonardo da Vinci, one of the most famous artists to ever walk the earth, one of the most creative people known for the famous painting of Mona Lisa and also the mastermind, the architect, the dreamer behind the Last Supper painting. His famous last words, I have offended God and mankind because my work, my work didn't live up to the quality it should have. I mean, hold on. His work offended God? Like, hold on. Let's stay here for just a second. His work offended mankind? Like, I'm not, I'm, I'm, for some of you, you have got a little, listen, this is the Mona Lisa and the last Supper. Like, his work offended God. This is Leonardo da Vinci. One of the greatest artists to ever walk earth and his creations offended God because they didn't reach the quality they should have. Listen, it was said of him that he was a perfectionist. 
And this is a window into his mind. This is a picture into his thought process. Now, I'm not an artist. I can't paint. You would not want me to paint a picture. It would go for absolutely nothing. Like, I would probably have to pay you to hang it on your wall. I'm just telling you. So I'm not an artist. And so I don't know that I can say that I would agree with his assessment of his own work. But with what I've been called to do, I can absolutely understand his mentality. Things could have always been just 1% better. Things could always be just a little bit better. So I understand his thought process. But just for clarification's sake, so we're all on the same page here. It is estimated that the Mona Lisa has a value of $860 million. $860 million. The Last Supper painting. And I'm talking about the original, not the one that hung on the wall above your grandparents' kitchen table. I mean the original <laughs> is estimated to be worth $450 million. One artist, two paintings, worth a combined $1.3 billion. But in the eyes of the master painter, in the eyes of the artist, it wasn't good enough. Could have been better. Famous last words. The title of my message today is simply that. Famous last words. There are many people who are able to speak their last words right before they pass away. And it is at that very moment, it is in that time that we find out what's most important to them. We get a glimpse into their mind. We get to peel back, if you will, the layers of their spirit to really reveal what the content and the character of their heart is. We get to feel in that moment people's vulnerability and their transparency. Jesus had some famous last words. Specifically, Jesus has, as we will for the next few weeks in this series, call his famous last words from the cross. First, we hear the word of forgiveness from Luke 23, verse 34. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. The word of forgiveness, the word of salvation in Luke 23, verse 43. And he said to, the, to him, to the criminal, Truly I say to you today, you will be with me in paradise. We have the word of forgiveness, the word of salvation, the word of relationship, John 19, verses 26 and 27. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said, Woman, behold your son. Then he looked at the disciple and said, Behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his own home. The word of forgiveness, the word of salvation, the word of relationship, the word of humanity from Matthew 27, verse 46. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which means my God, my God, why? Why have you forsaken me? The word of forgiveness, the word of salvation, the word of relationship, the word of humanity, the word of distress from John 19, 28. After this, Jesus, knowing everything was finished, said, and to fulfill scripture, I thirst. The word of triumph, John 19, 30. When Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. And then last, the last famous Word from the cross is the word of reunion. Luke 23, 46, Jesus calling out with a loud voice saying, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And having said that, Jesus breathed his last breath. These are the famous last words of Jesus. But before we dive into this series, I, I, I want us to have just a recap, if you will. If you, if you know the Easter story, I'm going to share with you what you already know. If you don't, I want, you to get on the, I want us all to be together going in the same direction. Jesus at this point had been betrayed by one of his closest teammates, had been denied by another one of his closest teammates. He is now beaten, he is now bruised, he's now bloody, and he is now broken. He is hanging on a cross, right when we get to our text, he's hanging on a cross. And even in the midst of the anguish, in the midst of all the pain, Jesus still had a message to preach. He'd been beaten, broken, bloodied, and bruised. Like He still had a message to preach on the cross with nails through his hand, nails through his feet, still was in the life-changing business. Jesus didn't change his purpose just because now he was hanging on a tree. Hanging on the cross, Jesus had some famous last words. 
Let's read Luke 23. A few verses from our main passage this morning. Two others who were criminals were led away to be put to death with Jesus. And when they came to the place that is called the skull, there they crucified him and the criminals, one on his right, one on his left. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they cast lots to divide his garments. Jesus is famous. Last word from the cross. The first is the word of forgiveness. And it is from the cross, but not just the cross. If you really dove into the life of Jesus, he actually preached the message of forgiveness for the entirety of his earthly ministry. We can even go back to Matthew chapter 6 where he, he said, For if you forgive other people, when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. Jesus came to earth from the very beginning with a message of forgiveness. And Jesus has said from the beginning, Hey, listen people, you need to forgive those who've wronged you. Forgive those who've done you dirty. Forgive those who've cheated you. Forgive those who've stolen from you. Forgive those who've taken advantage of you. Forgive those who've actually stabbed you in the back. Forgive those who've negatively talked bad about you behind your back. I mean, Jesus has said since the beginning, forgive those who hurt you. Forgive those who've sinned against you. And your heavenly Father will be sure to forgive you as well. So in all of the pain, and this is, this is what was incredibly like for me, is in all of the pain and all of the anguish of the cross, Jesus was still taking the posture to forgive. I mean, get this, even in the midst of the betrayals, even in the midst of the denials, Jesus still chose to forgive his closest teammates, his closest friends who had betrayed and denied him. Like in the midst of the cross, Jesus was still taking the posture of forgiveness. He's like, Father, forgive them. And if we take what he said in Matthew, if he was praying for forgiveness on their behalf, it meant that he had already given them forgiveness from himself. Jesus had already given grace. He had already extended mercy. Think about this for a second. He had just been betrayed by Judas a few days earlier and hanging on a cross, he had already forgiven him. Some of you have to endure every pain of the cross before you're willing to forgive those who've wronged you. You have to endure every trial and every pain, and you've got to come out on the other side before you're willing to forgive. And Jesus, in the midst of the pain and the anguish, says, I freely forgive. He had already forgiven Peter for denying him. He had already forgiven the religious leaders who were yelling, crucify him for their actions and their behaviors. The soldiers who literally were taking whips and beating his body to the point where many believe he couldn't even be recognized hanging on a cross. He had already extended forgiveness to them. And then maybe the hardest one for me to realize is hanging on the very tree that somebody grabbed a hammer and beat nails into his hands and through his feet. He had already forgiven those who were holding the hammer. And I want to tell you today, some of you have been hurt and you've been stabbed in the back and you're still holding on to the knife at which they stabbed you in. And the Lord is saying, it's time to let go. It's time to forgive. Jesus was living a message of forgiveness. And hanging on a cross, that message was on display for all to see. Friends, forgiveness is a sign of significant spiritual strength. Hear me this morning. Weak people can't forgive. Weak people hold grudges. Weak people get bitter. Strong people forgive and move forever forward. Not operating in what happened to me but anticipating what God has for me. Right. You remember that song from children's church? You grew up in the church. We, we, we sometimes get a small perspective on what God can do. And the reason why we don't forgive is we really don't believe that God can help us operate in the forgiveness stage of life. Remember that song, if you grew up in church, that my God is so big. Some of you are singing in your head, my God is so mighty. There is nothing that my God can't do. That's the Jesus that's hanging on a cross, freely forgiving. And his message of forgiveness from the cross was a sign of his incredible strength. But friends, it was also a sign of his endless love for us. Forgiveness is one of the strongest and greatest forms of love. No greater love than the love we receive from heaven. There's no greater love than the love we experience when we're in relationship with Jesus. And I mean, listen, 
These right here, listen to these words straight from the mouth of Jesus about love. John 15, as the Father has loved me, so I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love just as I've kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. Now, I want to illustrate this for you. When we say yes to Jesus, we get to experience his love. We get to experience like his relationship with him. And there's no greater love than we could ever walk with than the love of Jesus on our life. And what he is saying here is, I have kept the commands of the Father and I remain in his love. If you keep my commands, you now will remain in my love, which means you'll remain in your, the love of your creator. The only way to the Father is through Jesus. The only way to heaven is through Jesus. The only way to experience the love of God is to experience the love of Jesus first. Y'all, are you with me? And he goes on and he said, I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this to lay one's life for one's friends. No greater love than to lay your life down for a friend. And friends, Jesus willingly sacrificed his own life for all of us. And I think we need a picture into that today. Listen, he sacrificed his life for those who betrayed him too. Jesus willingly gave his life for those who denied him. He willingly gave his life for those who ridiculed and mocked him. Like he willingly gave it up for them. Jesus sacrificed his life and willingly gave it all up for those who believed in him and those who chose not to. Like for those who chose to follow him and those who chose not to. Jesus willingly sacrificed his life for those who loved him and those who chose not to, for those who celebrated and those who didn't. And his famous last word of forgiveness from the cross was one of the most ultimate messages of love and strength for humanity because he loved them and he loved you. And it is that message of forgiveness. If you need proof, it is the message of forgiveness that he preached while hanging on a cross that lets you know how much he really cares for you. Famous last words. Let's go back to the book of Luke, starting in verse 39 this time. One of the criminals who were hanged railed at Jesus saying, Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. And I want you to bookmark that statement right there. Save yourself and us. Everybody say that with me. And us. You with? Okay, stay, stay there. But the other rebuked him saying, Do you not fear God since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we are receiving the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. And he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus says to him, truly I say to you, today you'll be with me in paradise. Jesus' famous last words, we have the word of forgiveness and now we have the word of salvation. Jesus hanging on the cross with two convicted criminals. They've been sentenced to death. Thieves. Scripture doesn't talk much about them. All we know is what I will say is that basically these were the two dudes who were hanged by Jesus. That's all we really know. One hung on the right, one hung on the left. But what we can, what we can interpret from Scripture is one of these guys probably had some edge to him. Probably had a little bit of even some arrogance to his spirit. I mean, listen to what he said. He's like, Man, aren't you Jesus? Aren't you Jesus? Aren't you the Savior? Aren't you the Messiah? He's like, man, listen, save yourself. Save yourself. But actually, the character of his heart begins to reveal itself. It comes out because he doesn't just say, save yourself. He says, save yourself. Oh, and by the way, save us too. Listen, friends, in this, like, the content of his character wasn't about eternal salvation. He just wanted to be rescued from the consequences of his choices. He wanted to be saved from the anguish and pain that is what he was sentenced to, which is death by crucifixion. And the other guy looks at me, he's like, bro, for real? I mean, do you not fear God? Like, bro, seriously, we deserve to be here. 
this guy's done nothing wrong. He doesn't deserve this punishment. He's like, man, all, you're, all you are is worried about yourself. Come on, man. Like, remember, this is his partner in crime. And it, with sincerity in his heart and purity in his motives, he's like, hey, Jesus, would you, um, would you remember me when you come into your kingdom? Would you remember me when you come into your kingdom? And in this one statement, this one thief both confesses and acknowledges his sin, but also acknowledges and recognizes that Jesus is the only way to real salvation. Jesus is the only way to eternity in heaven. Jesus is the only way to the Father. Jesus is the only way to experience real freedom from sin. Like, listen, this is what Jesus said about himself. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one, say no one, one. comes to the Father except through me. Jesus says no one gets to heaven. No one gets eternity with God. No one gets salvation except through me. And then with a famous last word from the cross, Jesus says, hey, my friend, I tell you today, you will be with me in paradise. You will be with me for eternity. And it's that word of love and compassion where Jesus is simply telling this man, salvation has found its way to you today. So we have one man who just wanted to be saved from the cross. And hear me, for too many of us, we just want saved from anguish. Hear me this morning, we just want saved from the crisis. We just want saved from the cross that we are currently nailed to. We just want the storm to end, whatever it takes. We don't want deliverance from sin. We only want rescued from sin's consequences. And we are just like the dude on the cross. Don't deliver me from my sin. Don't deliver me from my transgressions. Just rescue me from the consequences of my choices, from the consequences of my sin. We want someone to come in and set us free, but we don't want someone to come in and set us free from sin. We just want to be freed from sin's consequences. And you have one thief who just says, hey, Jesus, rescue me from this cross. And the other says, Jesus, save me from my sin. Save me from my transgression. Salvation is a gift for the guilty, not a reward for the righteous. And one on the left is on the cross and is left there. And then the one on the right is now spending eternity in paradise with Jesus. The gift of salvation was available to both, but received by only one. Both guilty, both responsible, but only one gets to spend eternity with Jesus. And it was the one who chose to repent. It was the one who chose to recognize and accept that Jesus was who he said he was. That Jesus came to do what he said he was going to do. He willingly confessed of his sin and said, Jesus, remember me. Dr. and Pastor Tony Evans says this, salvation is a process that begins in a moment. If you are in a relationship with Jesus, you can probably pinpoint back to the moment where you you said yes to Jesus. And it was at that moment that everything changed because As Pastor Tony Evans says, salvation is a process that begins in a moment, but it transforms a lifetime. If that momentary experience of Jesus didn't turn into a discipleship relationship where you're actually growing to be more like Jesus, you've probably had moment after moment after moment wondering why life change hasn't happened, why transformation hasn't happened. Transformation sometimes takes a lifetime. It's that that lifetime of being reconciled over and over and over again, of growing closer and closer to Jesus. Salvation is a process that begins in a moment transforms a lifetime, and lasts for eternity. Hear me, friends. Salvation is the only thing in your life that's eternal. Your marriage is not eternal. Your relationship with your children, not eternal. Your relationship with Jesus absolutely is. And that gift of salvation was available for both thieves, and it's available for you today. And the famous last words of Jesus from the cross where the said forgiveness and salvation are available for us today.
It's not just being rescued from our misery. It's not just the removal of the crisis or even the ending of the storm. It's deliverance from sin. And I'm reminded back to John chapter 8 where a group of people had caught a woman in adultery and they brought the woman to Jesus. Now, they could have, by Jewish law, could have drug her out of the city and stoned her and killed her like they are well within their rights to do that. And this group of people decide, you know what, we're going to trap Jesus. So they bring the adulterer to Jesus and, and they say, Jesus, what do we do with her? And Jesus famously kneels down and just starts drawing in the dust. Who knows, maybe he did the outline of the Mona Lisa. We have no idea. And Jesus, in response to the accusers, is like, what do we do with her? And Jesus is like, he who is without sin cast the first stone. He who is without sin, you can throw the first stone. Remember, he's drawn in the dust. And one by one, every accuser starts to disappear until it's only the woman and Jesus left standing there. And Jesus, drawing in the dust, he looks up and... It's just him and this woman. And I'm sure the woman had this look on her face because she knew what the consequence, she knew what the consequences of her choices should have been. And Jesus is like, where'd everybody go? And I'm sure she had this amazement in her eyes and this just bewildered look of like, I can't believe what's happening. And Jesus is like, did anybody cast a stone? And she's like, no, nobody. Through a stone, nobody condemned me. And and Jesus, with grace and mercy, looks in her eyes and says, Neither do I. Now go and sin no more. But I think it's important for us today to recognize what Jesus didn't say. Because salvation is freedom from sin. Jesus didn't say, Forgiveness has found you. Now, keep, now go and keep sinning. Jesus didn't say, No condemnation from me. But why don't you go ahead and go keep committing adultery? That's not what Jesus said to her. Jesus said, Go and sin no more. Salvation is freedom from sin, eternity with Jesus. And the famous last words of Jesus, the word of forgiveness and the word of salvation, both gifts are available for you today. But it's your choice to receive. Just how it was the choice of the thief on the cross or the choice of the adulterer. Do you, do you accept that Jesus came to set the captive free? Do you accept that Jesus came to forgive those that caused hurt and heal those that are hurt? We are all in need of a Savior, and that Savior's name is Jesus. Forgiveness and salvation are right within your reach. But today you have a choice. You have a choice. You can choose forgiveness. You can choose salvation. You can choose made new living. You can choose to go in a new direction. You can choose an addiction-free life. You can choose to live righteous. You can choose a new path. Friends, you can choose to commit your life to live on Team Jesus. You can choose to make decisions that put Christ first. You can choose to prioritize your schedule so that Christ knows He's the primary priority in your life. You can choose to tithe and give and show Christ that He has full control of your life. Friends, these are all your choices. I want to let you know that the thieves on the cross had choices to make too. One of them chose themselves, and one chose Jesus. Which means one gets to spend eternity in heaven with Jesus while there's one who was left lonely on a cross and now is spending eternity in hell separated from God. So today, in this Easter season, you have a choice to make. You can seek forgiveness. You can choose to receive salvation. Today, it's your choice to receive Jesus, to come into your life and make you new. And just like Pastor Tony Evans says, happens in a moment. It transforms my life, and it's going to last for eternity because that's what forgiveness and salvation is for us. That gift is available for us, for you and for me right now in this moment, at this hour, today.